On the 8th of May in the year 1935, the American philosopher, educational reformer, and psychologist John Dewey penned the following remark. It is certainly a wonderful thing to see a go-getting Jew come out as a defender of the dogmas and sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. If unfamiliar with Dewey's life and thought, we could read this as a complimentary statement. Dewey, however, was not offering a word of praise. He, like many people familiar with the University of Chicago during the mid-20th century, observed an alarming phenomenon, conversions to Catholicism. What troubled the American pragmatists most was not so much the fact of Catholic conversions and Catholic converts as the identity of the converter. The Catholic evangelist in this case was not a priest, nor a preacher, nor even an apologetical pamphleteer. Quite the contrary. The man most credited with disposing minds towards Roman Catholicism was one of Dewey's own former students, an unbaptized professor from Manhattan who famously described himself as a pagan philosophical theologian. This man's name, of course, was Mortimer Jerome Adler. Dewey stood with allies in his disapproval of this professor from Manhattan. In 1940, the Trotskyist writer, James T. Farrell, wrote a virulent essay titled, Mortimer J. Adler, a Provincial Torquemada. Farrell identified Adler as a, quote, contemporary obscurantist and obfuscator who writes with a pomposity that some people mistake for profundity. His scholarship is superficial, and although he is fond of using the word logic, his reasoning is weak, even shabby. Worst of all, Farrell suggests, Adler might be called one of the leading American fellow travelers of the Roman Catholic Church. Close quote. With cynicism, Farrell recognized the irony Adler himself was not Catholic, not even a Christian. Yet Adler's students found the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church compelling. Farrell sardonically concedes that Adler does have one characteristic in common with many of the early Christians. They wanted their cake and they wanted to eat it too. The Emperor Constantine, for instance, waited until he was on his deathbed to be baptized. Adler, Farrell observes, is still delaying his baptism. In short, Mortimer J. Adler is merely a provincial Torquemada without an inquisition. Close quote. These details compel us, maybe, to ask a question. Who was Mortimer Adler and why were his students becoming Catholic? Fortunately for us, Adler penned not one, but two autobiographical accounts of his work and his life. Moreover, he frequently contextualizes his written academic discourses within his life and subjective disposition. Adler does not occlude inquiries into the personal context and motivations of his thought. He volunteers such details freely. The 78-year-old 20th century pagan, as he called himself, offered the following summary of his initial religious identity and upbringing. So this is Adler. I was born to Jewish parents. My Sunday school attendance terminated with participation in a confirmation class and in the ceremony of confirmation. Shortly after that, impelled by adolescent rebelliousness, I fell away from religious observance and became, as was characteristic of my age, a scoffer to the point of impiety. My parents were indulgent, requiring little more than my being respectful of their feelings in public. Though disinclined toward things religious, Adler did not lack academic interests and passions. A gifted and precocious child, he read the autobiography of John Stuart Mill at the age of 15. The book captivated the young Adler and it inspired him to pursue the intellectual life with committed vigor. Adler soon discovered Socrates, and he relates that this discovery, quote, formed my early resolution to try to become a philosopher, close quote. 
Adler relates that, as a youth, I read the autobiography of John Stuart Mill as I had never read any book before. The infant Mill had been tutored by his father, James Mill, and his father's friend, Jeremy Bentham, almost as soon as he was out of the cradle. When he was only three, he could read Greek, and by the time he reached five, he had read the dialogues of Plato and could distinguish, so he said, between the tricks of the Socratic method and the substance of the Platonic philosophy. At five, here I was, 15, almost 16, and I had never heard of Plato before, or Socrates for that matter, and I certainly did not make their acquaintance in Greek. The list of books that young Mill read under his father's tutelage between the ages of seven and 11 included many of the books that John Erkson had assembled for a special honors seminar that I was to participate in four years later when I reached my junior year at Columbia College. <coughs> Fortunately, Adler's philosophical development did not terminate in Mill and Bentham. His interests eventually matured into a consideration of the perennial wisdom found in Western thought. One notes that theological questions in particular drew the attention of the young intellectual. He explains, quote, in sharp contrast to the superficiality of my involvement in religious worship is my intense, profound, and lifelong involvement in the study of theology. It began in the early 1920s when, as an undergraduate at Columbia University, I first read Aristotle's Metaphysics and became fascinated with the argument for God's existence." Close quote. Aristotle, the founder of the Lyceum, introduced Mortimer Adler to Thomas Aquinas. Adler began to study the thought of the angelic doctor at the age of 20, shortly after his graduation from Columbia. Narrating his initial encounter with the Summa Theologiae in English translation, Adler recalls, I can remember my amazement on beholding 21 uniformly bound red Berkram volumes of the Summa Theologica on the shelf of the Benzinger Brothers store. I don't know what I expected, but certainly not that. Without knowing about the structure of the work or the significance of its divisions into their major parts, I decided to buy volume one, the title page of which bore the subtitle, Treatise on God. It cost two dollars and a half, a price which now seems as amazing to me as the size of the Summa did then. At that moment, Adler discovered the subject and teacher who fascinated him for the rest of his life. He considered his initial introduction to the angelic doctor as nothing less than cataclysmic in importance and influence. He says, the intellectual austerity, integrity, precision, and brilliance of that book, the Summa Theologiae, incomparably different from all the philosophical books I had read up to that time, and much more exciting to me, put the study of theology highest among all of my philosophical interests. Adler would return to the bookstore on subsequent Saturdays, purchasing the remaining treatises volume by volume, week after week. From that point on, theology emerged as the subject of consuming interest in his life. However, when recounting his 60 plus years fascination with Thomism, Adler outlines the stages of his philosophical and theological development in a rather peculiar way. What commenced, he says, as an interest in sacred theology eventually mutated into a preoccupation with natural and then transmuted finally into a purely philosophical theology as well as an anti-theological philosophy. Those words are Adler's own. Adler admitted the unusual direction of this speculative movement that he followed within Thomism. Even if unusual in its development, Adler's interest in the angelic doctor Aquinas continued to grow, and he recounts that over the next 20 or 30 years I read all the treatises in part one of the Summa Theologiae and many of the other parts dealing with moral theology, but not all of the Summa. 
One observes with interest Adler's specific attention to the secunda pars, the middle and moral part of the Summa Theologiae. Largest in size, this second section considers human happiness and the theological or theological life. See Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2686. Even though Adler read St. Thomas's account of what constitutes the good and therefore happy life, the grace he no doubt studied in the secunda, Prima Secundae of the Summa Theologiae seemingly did not move his inquiry from the level of theoretical dialectic to the speculative contemplation which accompanies the amata notitia of the divine friendship of charity. Adler himself readily concedes this point. He says, Since at this time I had no religious faith, my preoccupations with theology were entirely philosophical, and I did not yet fully understand the relation of the three domains of theology, sacred, natural, and philosophical theology. We recall that his philosophical emphasis often implied an anti-theological sentiment. After he earned a doctorate in psychology from Columbia University, Adler received an invitation from his friend, the famous Robert Maynard Hutchins, a recently appointed president of the University of Chicago to teach philosophy in the institution's law department. Adler's appointment engendered controversy, to say the least. Together, Hutchins and Adler fashioned a two-year course of study devoted to the great books of the Western world. Following a dialectical pedagogy inspired by Socrates, Adler and Hutchins fostered an educational model imbued with the great thinkers and ideas of Western thought. Within this context, Adler once again returned to the writings of the angelic doctor, much to the chagrin and indignation of his academic colleagues. One historian relates that Adler's, quote, espousal of Aristotelian philosophy and his agile defense of the version of Aristotelianism set forth in the bulky pages of Aquinas' Summa Theologiae seemed perverse and indeed incredible to most everyone he encountered at Chicago." Close quote. Such methods of teaching and emphases in teaching repudiated the pre-existing structures of cultured academia. Another historian of the University of Chicago notes that Adler's academic colleagues were, quote, simply flabbergasted by the spectacle of a non-observant Jew demanding that the official philosophy since 1870 of the Roman Catholic Church be taken seriously and explored on its own terms. Nonetheless, this was the position Adler took up when he showed up at Chicago, and his argumentative skill, combative temper, and connection with Hutchins soon made it impossible for others to overlook his surprising intellectual posture." Close quote. Thomism, thus, even in the hands of an admittedly unconventional proponent, emerged at the University of Chicago as a potent force. Although ostensibly insusceptible to the movements of grace in his own life, Adler's graces began to, or classes began to influence students on affective and intellectual levels both. More than a few of his students became Catholic. This perplexed and alarmed many people, Adler himself among them. He never intended to work as Catholicism's apologist and often credited other members of the University of Chicago's intellectual community for the growing number of Catholic converts. The following paragraph, extracted from a letter written by one of Adler's most brilliant graduate students, vividly adumbrates the situation. So this is from one of his students. The 30s, the 1930s, were a time of extraordinary intellectual ferment in Chicago, in large measure due to Hutchins and Adler. Their stance ran counter to the prevailing campus culture and was propedeutic so far as Catholicism was concerned. From them I learned to question the received wisdom of the semanticists, psychologists, sociologists, cultural relativists to respect 
the intellectual rigor of the Greeks and the medievals, to suspect the reductionism of the physical and biological sciences, to read a text in its own terms, define a concept, the nature of language, truth, knowledge, the nature of man, society, justice, the existence of God. The Hutchins-Adler training was a necessary but not sufficient condition for conversion. It made Catholicism intellectually respectable, but it did not make anyone become a Catholic. A much more powerful and intimate witness is necessary, I think, to enable people to act as contrary to our upbringing and education as our little group did. Regardless of Adler's express intention, however, his perceived role in these conversions only heightened the ever-growing tension between him and the rest of the University of Chicago. Adler referred to the years between 1938 and 1945 as his publicly Thomistic period. Furthermore, Adler happily maintained that his Thomism subsisted in an exclusively intellectual sphere without any ecclesial attachment. He professed allegiance to a non-Catholic Thomism. He says, quote, without becoming Roman Catholic, I had found a Thomist in philosophy, I had become a Thomist in philosophy as a result of my intensive study of the Summa Theologiae of Thomas Aquinas. Nonetheless, amidst the festering tensions between the University of Chicago, Adler found personal solace among the intellectuals in the Catholic academic societies and their journals. Adler highlights his contributions, in particular, to the Dominican speculative publication, The Thomist, in his autobiographies. Among the Catholics, his relationship with the Dominicans in particular grew into something akin to a genuine friendship. He says, during these Thomistic years, and also in the following decade, I was a frequent guest at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. Adler's profile continued to expand. During this point, he published his classic text, probably most famous to most of us, How to Read a Book, a work articulating his theories about education and learning, refined by semesters of application in his Chicago classroom. Adler, we might say, exercised a role analogous to the contemporary public intellectual. Quote, Mortimer Adler became a public philosopher, an intellectual who dared to engage in the great conversation, all his fellow citizens, in the conviction that common sense is indeed common. Close quote. This is from one of his friends writing about him after his death. His work paid off, literally. Adler's books sold very well. Indeed, the late Professor Ralph McInerney once recognized him, Adler, as, quote, the most highly paid philosopher in the United States. In the spring of 1938, Adler wrote to and received a reply from a Canadian philosopher and theologian who likewise began studying the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas at an early age. This man, however, unlike Adler, was thoroughly Catholic, and his name was Charles de Conic. The Canadian Thomist theologian, philosopher, artist, writer, Charles de Conic was born in the small town of Tort in West Flanders near Bruges on the 29th of July, 1906. When the young Belgian was eight, his family immigrated to the United States and settled in Detroit, Michigan where de Koenig's father, Louis, worked as a contractor. A middle child, de Koenig had two brothers and a sister. De Koenig's mother, Marie, died three years after the family settled in the States. In 1921, de Koenig's father sent his son back to Belgium to complete his education at the Collège Notre-Dame in Ostende. De Koenig suffered peculiar and de debilitating health difficulties throughout most of his early life. He distinguished himself, however, as a gifted student with a penchant for the sciences, Latin, and literature, particularly Shakespeare, whom he would ever love to recite from memory and held to be, quote, the best in all modern literature. 
Although adroit in the arts and the humanities, his scientific interests were paramount. This fascination with the things of nature influenced the direction of his study and future work. Quote, he liked to later say that he owed in large part his discovery of philosophy to a highly competent physics professor, close quote, from a, someone that knew him quite well. From the ages of 19 through 22, he spent three years reading philosophy with the Belgian Dominicans, where the Reverend Manes Matthias became his tutor and encouraged him to pursue his studies as far as the doctorate. His studies with the Dominicans instilled and solidified a deep love for the angelic doctor that would shape and permeate the remainder of his life. Charles de Koenig wrote that a philosopher he had but one desire, that as a philosopher he had but one desire, to be a faithful disciple of St. Thomas Aquinas. Like the contemplative from Aquino himself, the grace of the word that St. Dominic introduced into the world attracted de Koenig from an early age and he even entered the Dominican novitiate. Unfortunately, however, his poor health prohibited him from making vows in the order of preachers. He continued, therefore, studies as a layman and finished a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Louvain in 1934, defending a doctoral dissertation on the philosophy of Sir Arthur Eddington. And on the 27th of April, in the year 1933, Charles de Koenig married a young woman named Zoe, and they would eventually have 12 children. The future cardinal, Maurice Roy, invited de Koenig to teach a semester of philosophy at the University of Laval in Quebec City, immediately after de Koenig had completed his doctorate. An engaging lecturer, de Koenig quickly elicited the respect of faculty and students alike. Quote, Charles's teaching prowess prompted Laval to renew the invitation for another semester and the next year to offer him a regular professorship, which was in effect to last for the rest of his life, close quote. That's from his family. Soon students from all over North America sought the instruction of the Canadian Thomist. Ralph McInerney, perhaps the most famous of de Koenig's many doctoral students, calls him the best Thomist I have ever met, adding, that, of course, means he was the best philosopher. McInerney recounts his initial exposure to de Koenig while studying philosophy at the University of Minnesota with great fondness. The Canadian's charisma and speculative acumen captivated the young student. And de Koenig describes him thus. De Koenig, or uh, McInerney describes de Koenig thus. De Koenig was a short, plump man who sat when he lectured, beaming at his audience on the alert for the response to what he said. He ended almost every sentence with an interrogative A. He once wrote that his ambition was simply to be a faithful student of his master Thomas Aquinas. Discipleship seems to have either of two results. The disciple never emerges from what the master had accomplished and is content to retail it, or, and this was the case with de Koenig and the other giants of the Thomistic revival, Thomas was followed because his starting points were the inevitable ones. And by acknowledging and seeing where they led, one could go far beyond the text of the master while at the same time claiming that what one said was simply an organic extension. It is only in this second way that a tradition can live. And Charles de Koenig was the liveliest Thomist I have ever known. Such from the pen of Ralph McInerney. De Koenig loathed any effort to reduce Thomism to mere intellectual divertissements or cerebral calisthenics. St. Thomas Aquinas contemplated the real truth and a personal realism characterized De Koenig's Thomism. De Koenig maintained the integrity and the sublimity of the truth. He rejected the balkanization, the division of academia in general and of Thomism in particular. For this Laval professor, no part of human experience, personal, intellectual, moral, societal, lied outside of truth's reach and influence. In a word, he, de Koenig, appears before us as an outstanding representative of the Philosophia Perennis and a living, solid refutation of the current charge that St. Thomas, the man and the idea, is irrelevant 
to our times. His thinking, therefore, we might say, was truly sapiential. He was interested in wisdom. For the Canadian Thomas, searchers of truth, interestingly, should not ignore an element of theology and of revelation, and that being the Blessed Virgin Mary. For him, the Blessed Virgin Mary reveals to us the fullness of wisdom in its radical depth and contemplative sublimity. Now, to talk about the Koenig and Adler together, we observe a striking parallel between these two thinkers. First, both men enacted certain educational reforms. Adler grew in renown because of his efforts to promote the Great Books program. De Koenig also encouraged educational movements, albeit of less notoriety. Institutional history attests to de Koenig's interdisciplinary educational efforts at Laval University. Moreover, his work and legacy inspired the founding of St. Thomas Aquinas College in California. A dialectical and dialogical form of pedagogy characterized the styles of both professors. Each philosopher listed teaching students to think as their primary goal. North American philosophers and theologians quickly recognized the depth and insight of de Koenig's thought. His fame and influence spread. Unsurprisingly, Adler solicited de Koenig's evaluation of his, Adler's work. A meeting and correspondence ensued between the two philosophers, and their exchange culminated in June of 1938, when de Koenig replied to letters from the Chicago philosopher regarding 20th century philosophy in general and Adler's own recent book, What Man Has Made of Man in Particular. No mean missive, de Koenig's document runs almost 10,000 words in length. The letter's existence quickly became known among Thomists in North America. De Koenig generally himself disapproved of the wide copying and distribution of something so transparent and personal as this letter he wrote personally to Adler himself. Indeed, de Koenig introduces the letter to Adler by acknowledging, quote, I am really opening to you, Mortimer, a private drawer. This letter offers us readers a glimpse into the mind of one of the Thomist masters of the 20th century in unveiled sapiential authenticity. De Koenig begins his letter to Adler with high praise. I must say that I read you with a great pleasure, greater pleasure than any of our contemporary authors on those subjects, notwithstanding that I feel you have not enjoyed the rigorous schooling of a scholastic. But what you have done without this rigorous schooling is the more admirable. De Koenig, however, also expressed his general observations about contemporary thought with transparency. He says, quote, I am always conscious of the utter impossibility of meeting modern philosophers on a common ground. They are essentially dogmatic. They are forever telling us. They are like poets who are not to be interrupted. The prime reason for this lack of common ground surprises no one familiar with Aristotle and St. Thomas. De Koenig says, quote, they, modern philosophers, cannot stay on first principles. De Koenig blames the devaluation of principles on the failure to distinguish properly art and science. Science here meaning, of course, the classical sense of scientia. De Koenig says, in scientia, science, the object is first principles. It is the measure. On the contrary, the principle of art is in the one who fabricates, who makes. In perennial philosophy, the object is the dictator. In modern philosophy, the philosopher is a dictator. Intellectual dictatorship is the very essence of modern philosophy. How can we converse with dictators in philosophy? We cannot even indulge in dialectics. We have no common object. The philosopher makes the object. All he can do is tell us. We should note, of course, that de Koenig does not deny the importance of dialectics. Certainly, it plays a vital role in the pursuit of wisdom. The dialectics is essential as an introduction to philosophy because we must prepare the terrain via dialectics in order to determine the problems and definitions that philosophy pursues. 
Nonetheless, de Koenig rejects the reduction of philosophy to mere dialectics. Dialectical materialism, de Koenig worried, governs the day. He says, quote, a purely artistic conception of reality, a complete denial of speculation in nature, insofar as modern philosophy has enclosed, its, enclosed itself in the field of art, it has deliberately cut away the very possibility of communication. It is a philosophy that negates itself as philosophy. The true philosophers, de Koenig continues, are not politicians. Quote, they have no elections to win. They do not have to take seriously anyone who happens to open his mouth to speak, as politicians must do. They are concerned primarily and formally with speculative truth. Close quote. The philosopher's exclusive intent is that of knowing the truth about reality. In contrast, de Koenig says, the lines along which modern philosophy develops has nothing to do with this subject matter. It starts from a desire to make, not to know. The unmade is synonymous with unknowable. If reality is forgotten, which he feared would happen with the demise of philosophy and the rise of philosophy as art, the inversion of science and art, de Koenig feared that deleterious results would follow. The communication, thus, of modern philosophy is not a communication in science, he says, but only communication of products which have their principle not in the object, but in the maker. Thus, as many philosophers and philosophies that you have, you have as many makers, and there can be no point of commonality. This, he thought, has gravely harmed the contemporary mind to such a degree that philosophers have forgotten the importance of the real. He says, quote, The modern mind lacks the natural quality of the philosopher, the ability to grasp the transcendental import of first principles, of the est and non-est, that is, of being and of non-being. It has the obscure confidence of the animal. In fact, it does not need philosophy, the modern mind. Its actual needs are so easily satisfied. The nature of the things it wants is essentially platitudinous. De Koenig sets up this exp explanation of modern philosophy by a comparison, a, a contrast rather, between Descartes and Aquinas. He says, the thinking of modern philosophers starting with Descartes, with Descartes is more like a transitive action than imminence. They, he says, must have an audience. The ali stradere is prior to contemplari. Without an audience, there would be no certainty and no reason for philosophy. Notwithstanding his much affected isolation and his cogito, Monsieur Descartes never for a moment thought for the sake of thinking. He, Descartes, really abhorred solitude. All Descartes' thought is governed by an initial preoccupation to teach. De Koenig's reference in this statement to the Latin of the Summa Theologiae Secunda Secundae question 188, article 7, warrants further consideration. Sicut enum maius est illuminare quam lucere solum, ita maius est contemplata aliis tradere quam solum contemplari, which in English, as we know, for even as it is better to enlighten than merely to shine, so is it better to give to others the fruits of one's contemplation and then merely to contemplate. Friars preachers never grow weary of pointing to this beautiful articulation of the grace of the word St. Dominic introduced into the world. This contemplative illumination informs the study of the Dominican, transforms the life of the Dominican, and conforms the death of the Dominican to that of Jesus and St. Dominic. Moreover, Whenever there is a Thomistic discussion of light and illumination, one immediately thinks of the angelic hierarchy. The angels herald in their very being the speculative purity of contemplation. The inversion, therefore, of the practical, artistic, and the speculative, contemplation, philosophy, soccer doctrina, even for the angels, is deadly. De Koenig explains, he says, quote, 
The modern mind is a negation of open-mindedness, the negation of intellectus, understanding of first principles. It is, the modern mind, is obsessed by the demon of fabrication. It would do as the dark angels whose sin consisted in an effort to shape and lift themselves to the beatific vision. They wanted an object only insofar as they could build it through their own power. Their sin was against science. They chose the primacy of art. De Koenig, towards the end of the letter, speaks very personally to Adler. He says, quote, one cannot be both modern and open-minded, that is, objective. Objectivity is an innate quality of the intellect. It cannot be acquired. It is that perfection of the intellect which recognizes an object. The object itself does not make the objectivity of the mind. And then he says to Adler, you personally are open to Thomism. I should say that if you always were, it is not because Thomism has opened your mind. Millions are in the presence of the same object, but they do not heed it. Aristotle and Thomas were there to be recognized. I think that the first and main thing we have to do in their respect is to keep and develop them there as something that can always be recognized by those who look for the object. This is where modern scholastics have failed. When they are not considering traditions themselves as the formal object, instead of using them for an object, reality, they have turned to the moderns with the zeal of an apologist. They too are above all makers. I am convinced, says de Koenig, that the men who have actually rendered the greatest service have always remained hidden to the modern world, to their time. They are the Cajetans, the Bañezes, the Johns of St. Thomas. As speculative minds, they could not have done more without contaminating themselves. The theme of the hidden life of Thomism recurs throughout de Koenig's letter to Adler. He says, quote, I think Thomism triumphs when it lives in our world today. But I am also convinced that its life must be hidden because it is imminence in a world that has eyes only for pure extrinsicism. Thomism is not a door. There is a mass of Thomists today, but in this, because it is a mass, there is always a malum ut in pluribus. Thomism has reached therein one of its most profound forms of deformation. Lest he sound too strong, however, de Koenig offers a softening clarification. He says to Adler, by this I do not mean that we should hide it, Thomism. I mean that ipso facto it becomes hidden as we approach it more profoundly. The purer our Thomism is, and the better we speak of it, the less it is heard. I derive the greatest pleasure from reading you, Adler. It is to me recognition. But at the same time, thinking of the mass of your readers, I realize how futile you must sound in their ears. What you, ha what you then say becomes impossible. In this mass, I include your sc scholastic readers. I have read appreciations of your work in scholastic periodicals. I think that many of the criticisms on purely technical points are correct, but the best of what you offer is completely overlooked. And if you are right, it could not be otherwise. But I also feel that you do not realize this, that you, are t are, that you entertain certain vain hopes, having studied in strictly scholastic milieu during a period of 15 years and now working therein, I think that I have had a certain experience to support this opinion." Close quote. De Koenig, like the angelic doctor, was interested fundamentally in being, in reality, in principles, in the object reality is known. His whole life was ordered by and towards the truth. The primacy of being and truth came before all else and informs all else for Charles de Koenig. And he says, quote, I continually use the term Thomism, though I do not identify Thomism and philosophy or theology. As a Thomist, I consider it the closest approximation of philosophy. 
It is the only school in the path of philosophy. It will keep casting off waste matter as it approaches philosophy. Non-Thomas philosophy is not what is being assimilated, but what is being cast off in the process of the assimilation of the object. I believe no more in plurality of forms in the science of philosophy than in natural substance, nor can Thomism change its substantial form as it grows." Close quote, Charles de Koenig. Concluding sections. Adler appreciated de Koenig's lengthy letter. He said that he considered de Koenig one of the few Thomists with whom he could engage in profitable discussion. The Catholic Thomists, in turn, were praying for Mortimer Adler. Most of Adler's Thomist interlocutors believed that he was still a work in progress, a work with tremendous value, but still very much in motion. On the 13th of February in 1965, Charles de Koenig himself collapsed in his room at the Columbus Hotel on the Via della Conciliazione in Rome. This marked his second and final heart attack. He was only 58 years old. It was a Saturday morning when he died. He had just completed his task for the subcommittee of the congregation or the, the commission studying artificial contraception and had lectured the night before at the Canadian College in Rome and was scheduled for a private audience with Paul VI on the following Monday. He died, therefore, during the final year of the Second Vatican Council while serving as a theological peritus to his bishop. Time continued, even after de Koenig. Adler, although still resistant to the movements of grace, recounts his growing openness to Christianity. Writing in 1980, he remarks, quote, Since my youth, Adler, I have had little or no involvement in the ceremonies and practices of the Jewish religion or in the Jewish religious life. In later years, through marriage, I have become involved in the religious life of my family at least to the extent of frequently attending with my wife and children Sunday services in a Protestant Episcopal church. There have been moments in my life, he says, during my late 30s and early 40s and later in my early 60s when I contemplated becoming a Christian, in the first instance, a Roman Catholic, in the second instance, an Episcopalian. Suffice it to say, I have not done so. I have remained the pagan that I became when I fell away from the religion of my parents. The philosopher strove to maintain a detachment in his inquiry and thought, a detachment between his inquiry and his thought. Even though he liked Aquinas and continued to find him amusing, he still resisted the spiritual things in his own experience that he studied in Aquinas' texts. Things change, however. He says, quote, I am sure that many of my Roman Catholic friends wondered why I did not become a Roman Catholic. But with, very interestingly, but with the one exception of Father Robert Slavin of the Dominican House of Studies, none of them, his Roman Catholic friends, ever broached the question explicitly in conversation with me. Why not become Catholic? Indeed, this was a question Adler posed to himself. He says, there were moments in the late 1930s and throughout the 1940s that I put that question to myself. As I look back at the answers that I then gave myself, I think the reasons I gave were superficial. They cloaked my disinclination to become religious. I simply did not wish to exercise a will to believe. And from what I understood about faith as a supernatural theological virtue, which was a, a given which was given by divine grace, my will was not moved by faith. Here, we pause to observe that uh, something of an intriguing oddity. Adler, a self-admitted pagan, reflecting upon what Thomas have come to call physical pre-motion. So, winding this down. Mortimer Adler concludes his second memoir, titled A Second Look in the Rearview Mirror, with a touching chapter titled The Blessing of Good Fortune, in which he recounts a life lesson he learned early on from Aristotle. He says, quote, whether or not we succeed in having lived a good life is not entirely a matter of free choice and moral virtue. Virtue is certainly a necessary condition. It may even be the most important factor. 
but by itself it is not sufficient. The other necessary but also insufficient condition is having good fortune." Close quote. If Charles de Koenig were still alive when Adler penned these words, we might imagine de Koenig smile on his face, opening the Summa Theologiae of St. Thomas and pointing to a passage from the Prima Pars, where Aquinas says, quote, nothing hinders, nothing hinders certain things happening by luck or by chance if compared to their proximate causes, but not if compared to divine providence, whereby nothing happens at random in the world, as Augustine says, close quote, St. Thomas. The reason St. Thomas articulates the moral of the happy life according to the pattern of virtue is located in the fact that we first and foremost participate in the eternal law of God. The eternal law is simply how God knows the world to be. All real things necessarily fall under his knowledge, causality, and order. In other words, Adler, what Adler attributes to fortune, St. Thomas and St. Dominic, would allocate to God's providence. It is this providential ordered vision that constitutes wisdom. Late in life, Adler wrote an essay titled A Philosopher's Religious Faith. He had by this time become an Episcopalian. His friend and colleague, the late Ralph McInerney, whom we've already cited, offers the best summary and description of the movements of grace in Adler's late life and late thought. He says, McInerney, Adler was frequently asked how he could do so much, how he could know so much about Catholic theology without accepting it as true. He gave what he called a Thomistic answer. He had not been given the grace of faith, but that, one might say, is a Calvinist rather than a Thomist reply. The grace of faith is not offered to a select few and withheld from the rest. It is offered to all but each must accept it himself. Eventually, Adler became a Christian. Finally, he became the Roman Catholic he had been training to be all his life. That a number of prominent notices of Adler's death failed to mention this central event in his life is a distressing sign of how peripheral religion has become for so many in our time. Finally, McInerney concludes, a few years ago, a symposium on Adler's work was held in Aspen. Many papers were given, and Adler listened to them all. He was already very old. Indeed, he had to be helped into the seminar room by two of his sons. It was an occasion when he might have felt posthumous, but he never could be simply a third person. He had to be an interlocutor. The high point of the meeting was Adler's detailed response to all the papers. Speaking extemporaneously as always, it was clear that he hadn't missed a word and that the old feistiness was still there. But the truly memorable moment came when he spoke of the transition in his own life from being intellectually convinced of the existence of God to loving the God that he knew. The philosopher's God became incarnate in Christ. And finally, Adler saw this long quest for wisdom could best be seen as a kind of imitatio Christi, Ralph McInerney's writing. Finally, at long last, the American philosopher and public intellectual moved beyond the level of mere theoretical dialectics to the loving contemplation, indeed the amata notitia of divine friendship. Mortimer Jerome Adler, at long last, was fully Thomist. The grace of the eternal word reveals the gravity of being and the fullness of truth because it enables us to see all things in relation to God. And ultimately, grace orders us to God by knowledge and by love. This is the purpose of life. This is the secret to happiness. This is what Charles de Koenig discovered early on in his life and what Mortimer Adler discovered much later. For St. Dominic and for St. Thomas Aquinas, speaking about God and speaking with God, never were separated. They were always conjoined, united. May they likewise go together in us. May we always speak about God and with God as a single act. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Father Cuddy, for your excellent lecture.
Uh, we do have some time for question and answer. Uh, so we'll go to YouTube for our first question. <clears throat> uh, our first question comes from Morgan. How does one in encourage students to return to an understanding of philosophy as knowing reality in the contemporary secular environment? Would DeConnick or Adler have any pedagogical insight for us? So that's a very good question. I think DeConnick early on, he would have taken uh, the greater books approach whereby you read the classic works of philosophy and literature uh, written by great minds who were interested in knowing reality. And so that would be what DeConnick or sorry, Adler would have proposed a kind of a great books program, namely you will encounter reality f by the tutelage of great minds writing great books, classics. I think de Koenig would have taken a very more, uh, much more kind of terrestrial approach. He liked being outdoors, he liked to paint, he liked to bake bread. And so I think what he would probably say, first of all, is to tell the 21st century student to get off the computer, uh, the iPhone, YouTube, ironically, and live life. Think about what we experience and encounter. Reality is not elusive, it's everywhere, and in many ways what encumbers and hinders uh, the contemporary student from facing and discovering the beauty and depth and profundity of reality is we're looking at things which are virtually real instead of really real. So in a word, de Koenig would say, go outside, put away the phone, uh, ask questions, follow what interests you about reality. And Adler would probably say, uh, read the great books. Um, I must admit I'm a little more uh, sympathetic or connaturalized to de Koenig's approach, but certainly great books are of a help as well. Excellent. Um, uh, maybe, maybe here's a question leaning into uh, to Adler's approach. Uh, what does it mean to be an intellectual? So Adler and DeConnick devoted their lives to the intellectual life. How does one engage in the pursuit of truth even if one is not a PhD trained ac academic or a student? So that's a, an interesting question. I think, and this is, comes up in the letter that de Koenig wrote to Adler, um, de Koenig thought that every person was an intellectual because every person has an intellect and the intellect, the power of knowing, is always meant to be, we can't ever stop it from seeking to desire to know the truth to know what is, to understand reality with all of its simplicity and unity and distinctions. So for de Koenig, being an intellectual means being a human who's fully aware and engaged in reality, in life, in God, in friendship, etc. Adler had a little bit of a different approach which de Koenig tries to pull him back from and that is for, de for Adler, being an intellectual is almost a job. Namely, he wanted to read all of the modern authors, John Dewey, et cetera, Aquinas, the old authors, and put them in dialogue and discussion. And certainly de Koenig is not opposed to that, but what he cautions Adler against is thinking that being an intellectual is only on this kind of academic or uh, professional level of dialogue and engagement between smart people. And what de Koenig's true point is, if you start to do that, then being an intellectual becomes a, becomes a club where you market yourself and your ideas and your books and your writings. You're trying to be innovative to distinguish yourself. And de Koenig says, in the end, you can lose reality and you can become very isolated and you can forget about reality. And ultimately, this is implicit in the letter, you'll become unhappy because no uh, conversation partner, no idea can make us truly happy. What makes us truly happy is union with the truth, good, wisdom, real things that perfect the human person. So in a word, de Koenig thought being an intellectual meant being fully human, being fully virtuous, and living life uh, in the way that encourages and fosters human flourishing. For uh, somebody who is, uh, so this question comes from JL on YouTube, and he asks, what is the best way to go about studying St. Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica? <laughs> and um, I must let you know, Father Cuddy, that you're contractually obligated to mention Aquinas 101 in your answer. Well, thank you. We will do that. So first thing, uh, with the contractual obligations I must fulfill, uh, the YouTube videos Aquinas 101, where you have a number of uh, specialists in Aquinas explaining with clear examples and parts and divisions and distinctions, uh, significant themes in Aquinas' thought. So go to YouTube, you're already there. After this, you can log, uh, search for Aquinas 101, you'll find several hundred videos that are good starting points. 
If you want then, after exhausting that, to take the next step, my sincere recommendation would be to do uh, two things. One would be to get uh, the books in philosophy of D.Q. McInerney. D.Q. McInerney, you can find them, they're published by the Priestly Fraternity of St. Peter. And D.Q. McInerney is something like uh, a Scott Hahn of philosophy, a gifted teacher, writer, very clear, who breaks down all of Aquinas' philosophical distinctions in very readable, comprehensible parts. Now, why is that important? It is in part important because if we don't understand what being is, philosophy, then we're not going to understand what supernatural being and reality are, which we know about through theology. So that's the first thing. I would read through particularly Professor McInerney's books on the uh, philosophy of nature and of metaphysics, if not the logic and t philosophical psychology, but particularly physics, metaphysics, published again by the Priestly Fraternity of St. Peter, written by D.Q. McInerney. Then I would begin to read the Summa, again, Council, with the help of Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange's books, which are exp 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 uh, explanations, expositions of the Summa. And with basically McInerney is helping you get ready the philosophical tools to understand sacred truth. And Garrigou is a wise teacher to guide you through the Summa. Um, if you read, read Garrigou's commentaries on the Summa, which are in English, most of them, and more are being translated with the Summa in front of you, um, I think, uh, I can't think of a better way to do it at this point in time. So, Peter Francis asks from Facebook, is DeConnick widely read or studied among present-day Dominicans during their, uh, during their formation and schooling, or is he mostly confined to specialists? Adler is famous for the Great Books program and How to Read, but what's the present-day uh, state of DeConnick studies? So that's a good question. So in my classes, yes, my students know about DeConnick, but to answer your question, DeConnick, what, what's different is that Adler was a much better writer in terms of style. He wrote po popular works of philosophy that engaged big questions, but on a level that everyone could understand if you were intelligent and serious. For example, his classic book, um, Aristotle for Everybody is a very readable introduction to Aristotle's thought, which is still in print. De Koenig didn't write books so much as academic articles, often a very brief length, where he'd make a speculatively profound point. So De Koenig's writings were not as numerous or as widely circulated as Adler's. But thankfully, uh, Ralph McInerney, again, the best student of De Koenig, according to De Koenig himself, before he died, Professor McInerney translated a lot of de Koenig's writings in the two volume, uh, The Writings of Charles de Koenig, published by the University of Notre Dame. So those are available. And also uh, the University of Laval in uh, Quebec, where he taught, has recently in the last couple of years published his writings in French in I think seven or eight volumes. Um, so there's much work to be done. Many doctoral students, I know John Brunghardt is very interested in De Koenig. He wrote a masterful doctoral dissertation on De Koenig's uh, understanding of uh, the relationship between natural philosophy and physics, scientific method. Others are very interested. And I think uh, Father Gilbo, professor at the Dominican House of Studies with me, uh, wrote his doctoral dissertation in Switzerland on De Koenig's political philosophy and theology. And I think for anyone interested in taking the next step, uh, they should pick up the translations of McInerney available on Amazon from the University of Notre Dame Press. 